The Idris Shah Foundation Podcast. Practical psychology for today. Featuring the works of Idris Shah, narrated by David Ott. Welcome to the Idris Shah Foundation Podcast. On this edition of the podcast, we will hear selections from A Veiled Gazelle by Idris Shah. Belief A Sufi was once faced with a band of visitors who had travelled an immense distance to sit at his feet. Their belief in his perfection and infallibility had given them the strength to scale mountains, cross deserts, navigate oceans, and endure all the hardships which had been their lot. When they arrived in his presence, they threw themselves on their faces before him, begging to be allowed to devote themselves exclusively to his service. Do you believe in me and in whatever I might say? the Sufi asked them. They answered, We do, everything and implicitly. Very well, said the Sufi. I shall now test the depth of that belief. Test us, master, cried the devotees. The Sufi continued. Now listen to this claim. I am not here at all. Can you believe that implicitly? The would-be disciples hesitated, and then, one by one, they confessed that they were unable to believe that he was not there. The Sufi said, Although you have been motivated and sustained by feelings, you are really men of words. Your feelings cannot keep pace with your words. You say, I can believe anything, which is words. When you are asked to believe something, you cannot, which shows the lack of deep feelings. You are false even to your own assertions. Camel's Head Ajib the thief one day found a camel's head on a rubbish dump. He took it home and wrapped a piece of silk around it and took it to the market to sell. The silk merchants looked at the bulky parcel and one after another offered him such a low price that it was no more than the worth of the actual silk without the bulk represented by the camel's head. All right, said Ajib at length to one of the rascally merchants. I'll accept your price, which seems fair enough to me. The man is a fool, thought the merchant. Aloud, he said, Is there anything inside the silk to bulk it out? Ajib said, Camel's head. The merchant thought, He's getting angry, so I'd better pay him quickly in case he sells this heavy bundle to someone else. So he paid Ajib. Some days later he saw Ajib in the street and took him at once to the summary court, charging him with false pretenses. When you were asked whether there was anything inside that bundle, why did you say no? asked the merchant. You may have heard me say no, but what I actually said was camel's head, said Ajib. I imagine that you heard me through your greed, not your ears. Case dismissed. The Horse Khan, Son of a Khan Once upon a time there was a great Khan, and this Khan had three beautiful daughters. The first was called Silk, the second was called Pearl, and the third, the youngest, was called Zephyr. One day the Khan said to the three girls, Come, daughters, it is time that you were married. The first shall marry my court poet, who is also a great swordsman. The second shall marry my standard-bearer, who is also a valiant knight. As to the third one, well, I shall come to that later. The two girls were duly married, and the celebration of their weddings occupied twice forty days and forty nights, with sherbets and bonfires, feasts of jollity, gifts, and everything that could make a great occasion. Then the Khan said to some of his men, I am tired of all this frivolity. I think that I shall go hunting. They all set out, accompanied by a splendorous retinue, and arrived at a ruined castle on a hill. 
We shall camp here for the night, said the Khan. No sooner had he laid himself down to rest than a huge dev, a giant ogre, came rising straight out of the ground and towered in front of him. Peace upon you, muttered the Khan. How fortunate that you should have saluted me. If you had not, I would have eaten you alive, roared the dev. What can I do for you? asked the Khan. There is, alas, nothing that anyone can do for me now, said the dev, because I have been trapped in a deep well just below where you are sleeping, and I am allowed out only at night when there is nobody awake to terrorize. I am glad about that, said the Khan, but who is it that has the power to catch and imprison the enemies of man in this amazing manner, since Suleiman the son of David, upon whom be peace, is no more upon the earth? Do you remember the meek dervish who called and saluted you during your daughter's wedding celebrations? asked the dev. Well, it was him. That dervish, exclaimed the Khan, but he did nothing to me, although I did not obey his instructions in any particular. You have a second chance, said the dev, because he always tells one twice. He told me to give up my abominable ways twice too, but I did not believe that he had any powers. So saying, the dev gave a deep sigh. I must return to my well now, he said, and sank back into the ground. The next morning the Khan woke at dawn and immediately returned to his capital. No sooner had he sat down in his audience chamber and the drums announcing the Durbar began to beat, then the same inoffensive-looking dervish presented himself for an audience. O Khan, he said, I have come to give you a present. You have married your daughters off in haste. I agree that it was to worthy men, but it was without consulting a dervish. Yes, said the Khan, I am sorry about that. Well, said the dervish, you now have another chance, but it will be a hard one. Take this horse and marry your daughter to it. The Khan was not sure whether he could believe his ears, but he decided that he should do as he was commanded. He sent his daughter to the horse's stable and made her live there. What he did not know, and neither did anyone else, was that as soon as Zephyr entered the stable it was transformed into a beautiful and luxurious bower, and the horse was really a magical man, a youth who could change into human form again only when he was with a beautiful maiden. I am myself a Khan and the son of a Khan, he told her, and I am here to teach trustworthiness. This is the only way in which it can be done. Remember, therefore, that no matter how tempted, you must never disclose that I am a man. Zephyr promised him, and even when there were rumours that she was married to a horse or to someone beneath her, she said nothing. Now the day came when the Khan announced the annual feast and fair at which the most valorous men in the land were to compete in feats of arms. The ladies' pearl and silk looked admiringly upon their husbands as they rode into the arena, mounted on wonderful chargers, to defend their titles as the foremost warriors in the land. We have heard something about your husband, sister, they said to Zephyr, but perhaps this is a time to watch manly daring and admire excellence in combat, rather than to talk of mysterious things. In bout after bout, contest after contest, the court poet and the standard bearer overcame their opponents. The applause was heard from Herat to Barakshan, and the clanging of spears, the buzzing of arrows, and the clash of swords was mingled with the thundering of hooves and the flashing of accoutrements as the champions prevailed again and again against the men of all High Asia. And as one bout followed another, as one gasp of excitement, one round of applause, one cry of triumph followed another, Bibi Zephyr found herself more and more wishing that she could say that her husband was a Khan, son of a Khan, and could, if he wished, beat all comers on the field that day. 
the contests were to last three days, and on the second night the horse Khan said to his wife, Khanum, I shall take the field tomorrow. I know how much you have yearned to see me acquit myself. Tomorrow you shall. But let me warn you, this will be a severe test for both of us. Tell nobody that I am your husband, no matter how strong the temptation. And if anything should go wrong, take these three horsehairs. If you need me, burn one of them. Remember, too, that there are only three of them. The next morning, as the heralds were announcing the names of the champions left in the contests, a strange knight with a steel skullcap and a crimson turban wound around his face, almost covering it, incomparably well mounted, rode into the arena. When Zephyr saw that his banner showed only a huge horseshoe, she knew that it must be her husband. The horse Khan took on his two brothers in law both at once, wrestling on horseback and with the blunted lance, the long sword, and the dagger. He vanquished both of them in a few minutes. Zephyr's sisters were half in tears and half excited to know who the mysterious stranger was. As he went on to dispose of all the champions, sometimes one by one, sometimes in groups, Zephyr could not restrain herself any longer, and she told her father, sitting beside her, That is the Khan, the son of a Khan, and he is my husband, married to me in the form of a horse. He is a magical man, here to try our patience. The Khan, remembering that the horse had been given to him by the dervish, said, This is a serious business, daughter. You have broken your word and failed the test. I fear for you and for us, for it is we who have trained you so badly that faults have become apparent under stress. As he said this, the horse Khan left the field. That evening, when she went to her apartments, the Bibi Zephyr found a letter from her husband. It said, I knew by the weakness which seized me on the field today that you have told someone my secret. I have had to go, and I may never see you again. Zephyr was beside herself with grief. Suddenly she remembered the three hairs and burned one. Immediately the dev from the well which her father had seen on the hunting trip appeared. I did not want you, said Zephyr. You must have been thinking some evil thought as you burned that hair, said the dev, because that is how these things work. How can I get rid of you? asked Zephyr. Only by calling the dervish, said the dev. Zephyr used her second hair to make the dervish appear. Within a few seconds he had banished the dev to his well and had himself vanished. And then she thought as hard as she could and burned the third hair, asking for her husband to come. Now there is no more that we can do. I am no longer a horse, but an ordinary man, and a Khan, son of a Khan again. We can now live happily until the end of our days. But never forget that if we had been able to use the three magical hairs better and not spend them on our own welfare, it would have been better for everyone. Tigers There was once a Sufi who was the companion of a certain king. The king said to him, I cannot understand your philosophy, just as I cannot help admiring Sufis as the most interesting people whom I ever meet. The Sufi said to the king, Tell me one of your difficulties in understanding. The king said, How, for instance, can a sound affect a person, especially a cultivated person, more than a word? Any animal can make a sound. Words are a higher form of utterance. The Sufi said, When you are in a suitable condition, I shall demonstrate to you what this may mean. Now one day the Sufi and the king were on a tiger hunt. The king, who was a most talkative person, would not keep quiet and repeatedly forgot not to raise his voice. Tiger after tiger was frightened away. 
The hunter who was with the party at length came to the Sufi while they were resting, bowed low, and said, When skill and repute fail, it is said that the only recourse of man is to the wise. Could your presence not perhaps prevail upon his majesty to remain silent when we are stalking tigers? This unworthy individual craves your help, for if we do not bring back a tiger from this hunt, it is I who will get the blame for the king's own shortcoming, and my wife and children, as well as my reputation as a hunter, will suffer. The Sufi agreed to help the hunter. When they had caught up with the king again, he saw that the monarch was still talking. Then the Sufi said, softly, Tai? At once the king was as silent as a grave, and he whispered so low that even a tiger could not have heard, Gurz? The Sufi said, Now that your majesty has deigned to become silent for a moment at the sound Tai, and even contributed the nonsensical sound Gurz, allow me to say that words such as Please be quiet, or if we talk we shall scare the tigers away, or even hush, have had no effect all day on someone who claims that words are superior to sounds. Furthermore, please note that people generally know very well what other people mean. I cannot understand, may be composed of words, but it does not really mean anything once we test it. I have just tested your I do not understand what you mean by your philosophy. Unsolved Two worthies of the land of fools heard that someone called the Polite Man was visiting their capital. Desiring to meet him, they went to the city's main square. Here they saw a stranger sitting on a bench. Do you think that it's him? one asked the other. Why don't you go and ask him? The first man went up to the stranger and said, Excuse me, but are you the polite man? The stranger answered, If you do not leave me alone, I'll smash your face in. The inquirer went back to his companion. Well, was he the man we're looking for? I don't know. He didn't tell me. Guru, the Perspicacious Mouse one evening, a mouse named Guru was scampering through a house when he heard the sound of children crying. Feeling sorry for them, and also being quite inquisitive, he stopped. He saw a sad sight. The father of the family was trying to light a fire, but the wood was damp. Can I help you? said the mouse. The man was too worried to be very surprised at being spoken to by a mouse, so he just said, if you have straw, you can help me. I must feed these children, but there is no kindling to start the fire. So Guru ran to his nest and brought the man several pieces of dry straw. Soon the fire was blazing and the children were being fed. They were all happy. I am a real benefactor, said Guru, and I deserve something for this. Of course you do, said the man. He promised to tell his children the story of Guru the Mouse, the great benefactor, who appeared as if by magic and gave them just what they needed. Fame is wonderful, said Guru, but I want something more tangible as well. So the man gave him a large piece of freshly baked bread. Guru carried it away. Usually it took him days to collect as much food as this, and all for a few wisps of straw. Wonderful! He decided to follow up any sign of human beings in distress in future, in case it might prove profitable. Already he saw himself as an individual with a special mission. The very next morning he was creeping along the floor of the house next door when he heard some children crying. Guru scampered up to them. Children, what is the matter? Our father is a tinsmith, 
said one of the little ones, and he has gone to his shop to try to earn some money to buy food for us. But we are hungry, and that is why we are crying. Guru had an idea. I have some bread, he said, and I will give it to you. What can you give me in exchange? When he carried the bread to the children, they were overjoyed and said, Take this tin cup. We are sure that our father would want you to have something in return for such a kind action. Guru took the cup. As he dragged it away, he called back at them, Remember Guru the perspicacious mouse and what he did for you. But by then the children were fed and laughing, and all the more so to see a mouse pulling a tin cup. Never mind, said Guru to himself. It is not how it looks to others, but what it looks like to me. I have proved that I am a benefactor. Have I not just given away several days' food in return for a piece of metal? He had to take the cup out through the front door of the house, because it was too large to get into his hole from outside. As he was manoeuvring the cup under the large crack in the doorstep, he heard an argument in the dairy across the road. Guru left his cup and went to see what it was all about. He found the dairyman trying to milk a cow into his shoe. In this way, he lost a lot of the milk as he carried it to the pail. What are you doing? shouted Guru. My milking pail has rusted away, said the dairyman, and this pail is too high to get under the cow, so I'm using my shoe as a milking pail. You are losing a lot in that manner, friend, said the mouse. Supposing I were to give you a nice new shiny cup, would you like that? Very much, said the milkman. So Guru gave the man the cup, and he was able to finish the milking easily. Soon he had forgotten Guru, and the mouse ran up to him as he was leaving the dairy. What about my share? he cried. The man began to laugh. You are only a mouse. I have got the milk and I have put the cup out of your reach. You cannot have anything. It is bad business to do something without first having a contract. But there was a verbal contract, protested Guru. Then take me to court, laughed the man. Who would believe you? Just for that, stormed the mouse, I will demand your cow in payment. No, nothing less. Ho, ho, roared the dairyman. All right then. If you can take the cow away, you can have her. And he staggered out of the dairy with tears of laughter rolling down his cheeks. As soon as the man had left, Guru spoke to the cow. Listen, mother, you heard what your owner said. I am your master now. You must follow me and treat me as you did him. That sounds fair enough, mooed the cow providing that you give me somewhere to stay and something to eat when I need it. You must also milk me when I need it. We will attend to those details when we come to them, said Guru, but meanwhile you must follow me. And he led the cow out of the dairy, holding on to the end of her rope. Of course, he could not get the animal into his tiny hole, so he decided to head for the open country to see what fate might have in store for him. Before very long, he found that the cow was leading him because she kept on straying from one patch of juicy grass to another. The mouse had become so important in his own eyes, however, that he said to himself, Since I have no real home now, any direction is better than none. This being so, we cannot truly say that the cow is leading me. What counts is who holds the free end of the rope. In this way, the cow pulled the mouse farther and farther into the countryside. Some of the people whom they met were amused, some amazed, and Guru soon became clever enough to cry out whenever a cowherd was seen and to shout, That's right, keep on, or good, turn left here, just after the cow had made some move or other but the cow was becoming a real burden. For one thing, the mouse could find little food to his taste in the pastures favoured by the cow. Furthermore, there was always the threat of milking time, and he had no answer to that. 
As he was thinking about this, while still calling out, Good, stop here, and fine, just finish up that tuft of grass, he saw a small group of soldiers camped in a glade. The cow and the mouse stopped near to them, and Guru asked them what they were doing. If a mouse can understand, said the leader, we are a special group of the king's guards. As we have not been paid for months, we are at the point of mutiny. And, to top it all, we have been given the chore of escorting that princess over there, in the sedan chair, to her father's summer capital for the hot weather. No ordinary mouse, if you please, said Guru with a courtly bow which quite impressed the soldiers. I am Guru, the perspicacious, of whom you may have heard under various names, such as the mouse with the cup, the giver of bread mouse, the fire-making mouse, and so on. And what can you do for us? asked the chief of the soldiers. For we have a fire and nothing to drink out of a cup. Furthermore, you do not appear to have enough bread with you to suffice us. My benefactions, said Guru, are always based upon exchange, for this is the system which has stood me in good stead. It might also be said that I have discovered the principle that all things work by exchange. We have nothing to give you, said the soldiers all together. But you have, said Guru. Give me your burden, the princess. Then you can desert, sell your arms, eat or sell the cow, and generally rearrange your lives. Desertion is a serious crime against our lord the king, said the first soldier. No mouse ever owned a cow, said the second soldier. It would be nice to be free again, said the third soldier. What has the cow got to say about it? asked the fourth soldier. I want to know more about all things work by exchange, said the fifth soldier. But the leader said, It seems like a strange and probably beneficent intervention of fate in our lives. Men, we shall take the cow, for I refuse to bear this hardship any longer. So they took the cow, milked her, and had a drink, and they disappear from our story. The mouse sat politely outside the palanquin for some time, and finally the princess drew the curtain. Seeing that the soldiers were gone, she began to weep, for they were in the middle of a wilderness. Your Highness, said Guru, you are now my bride, by virtue of the principle discovered by me, and continuously and successfully applied, known as, all things work by exchange. This is absurd, said the princess. Mice do not talk. If they do, they don't know anything about principles. If they do, they cannot exchange things for king's daughters. Life is better arranged than that. But the mouse, by patience and sweet talk, and because there seemed no alternative to his version of the affair, made the princess follow him to a hole under a rotten tree which he had espied during his talk with the soldiers, and considered to be a safe and pleasant bridal home. Enter the home of Guru the Benefactor, he said to his bride. You may be very clever, said the princess, but you have forgotten that a human being cannot enter a mouse hole. And then you can stay outside, said Guru, rather annoyed. Sleep under that brushwood. But I must have food. You can eat those carrots growing in that field. I am a princess, not a gnawing animal. I need sugar plums and delicate things to eat. All things work by exchange, said Guru, and if you need those things, you will have to gather wild fruits and take them to market, sell them and buy what you need. The next morning at dawn, the princess awoke and started to collect wild fruits. She made a bundle from her veil, and she and Guru started off for the market, which was in the city where her father ruled. As they entered the city, the princess began to cry, Buy my wild fruits, for I have to have sugar plums. All things work by exchange. My bridegroom will give me none. The king, hearing his daughter's voice, sent out a party of his guards to bring her to the palace. The mouse concealed himself, and when she appeared in the audience chamber, he stepped forward. Great king, father-in-law, greeting, I claim my bride. A 
By what right is she your bride? asked the king, although he had already heard of the tale from the princess. By the right of the immutable law, all things work by exchange. You got this city by an exchange of lives. You protect the people, they give you money in exchange. If a mouse starts to exchange, everyone mocks and says it is impossible. I appeal in the name of the unchangeable law. Flout it if you dare. The king turned to his ministers, who counselled him. Uh, Majesty, although we have never before heard of this law, uh, upon reflection we cannot see any case which does not fit it. Uh, we therefore conclude that it is indeed a hitherto unobserved but nonetheless immutable law. Is there none who will deliver me from this opinionated mouse? The king cried in anguish, and all the more so because the doctors of the law were looking upon Guru as someone who, having produced a new law, might present them with another one at any moment. Then a certain dervish, who had been at the court for many years, but had never spoken except in riddles, stepped forward and whispered into the king's ear. The monarch's brow cleared, and he announced, The doctors of the law have spoken well, and the dervish has spoken well. Cause the mouse guru to be proclaimed my son-in-law by virtue of the great immutable law of all things work by exchange. This law is henceforward to be applied throughout my realm. It will first be tested in this our court. Then the king called Guru to come forward and seat himself beside him. Guru ran up the steps of the throne and started to perch on the brass platter beside the king. But under this was a brazier, and Guru was badly scorched. He appealed to the king, How can I sit there, O king, for it is too hot for me? It is the custom of this country that the son-in-law must sit beside the king. This is his place. He picked up the mouse and held him over the heat. In a few seconds Guru felt as if he were roasting and cried out, Who will exchange this terrible heat for the hand of a king's daughter? I will take it back, said the king, and he let the mouse go. Guru scampered away as fast as he could until he had quit the land. You gave me advice, said the king to the dervish, and in exchange I bestow upon you the hand of the princess. For, after all, is it not a law that all things work by exchange? Will it work? Once upon a time there was a man who decided that he was wasting his life by having a house, a car and a job. So instead of having somewhere to live, something to get him around and something to do, he only had to worry about which hedge he slept under, whether he had corns on his feet, and whether he was doing his ritual mantrams and wearing the right spiritual clothes and eating the latest miracle foods. Then he came across a really wise man, and to him he said, I feel that I have been wasting my life because since I stopped wasting my life by conventional activities, I have just carried on unconventional but equally stereotyped spiritual ones. I cannot tell you what to do, said the really wise man. You should stop relying on chants, dress and diet. Stop imagining that music, incense or dancing, horoscopes, books of divination or perfumes, crazy companions and so on will do you any good, if you want to have knowledge. Marvellous! gasped the disciple. And will this make me truly wise? No, said the wise man, but in comparison to what you were like before, you automaton, it will seem like it.
This audio is made available by the Idris Shah Foundation and is copyright 2019. All rights reserved.